I'll welcome everyone to another Territory 3 um, webinar. Today we've got Colette Zaro from West Talent with us and we're going to be talking all about remote working, um, how to manage, how to hire staff remotely if that's something that you need to do, um, especially coming into this the whole COVID pandemic again. Um, and here in New Zealand things have been changing a lot and a lot of people have gone back to remote working so this is quite a topical thing at the moment. Um, which is why we're really happy to have Colette here um, to have a chat about, you know, ways ways you can work around this and, and that move back to remote working. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to chuck them in the Q and A um, as we go along, and I'll keep I'll keep an eye on those and the chat as well. Um, but we'll we'll go through a couple of different topics. But anyway, I'd love to introduce Colette if you'd love to do a little bit of a a background on what you're up to at the moment. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Lilia. Um, I am really excited to be chatting about this today. Um, I About six months ago, I founded List Talent, and we provide head of talent consulting services, uh, and we also embed recruiters into uh, early stage startups and help them scale their teams. Uh, so I work a lot with startups, uh, mostly in the Bay Area, um, to really help them build a HR, recruiting and talent strategy, uh, and then you know, work with their recruiters um, to help build those teams as well. Uh, and then prior to that, I was uh, a senior director with Russell Tobin. Uh, they're a fairly large staffing firm here in the US. And I originally started with them in New York and I I moved out to, to San Francisco and uh, ran their office in, in the Bay Area. Uh, so I grew that team from about two people to 40. Uh, and we had uh, people across the US and in India, uh, and actually only about maybe 10% of those people based in the Bay Area. So I'm um, very interested in building a remote team um, throughout, uh, throughout COVID as well. Um, and then our team actually worked with a lot of the big tech companies here in the Bay Area, the likes of Facebook, Twitter, uh, Apples, um, and we partnered um, either exclusively or preferred partnerships to help manage their contract workforce. Um, and so, you know, through the pandemic, we were helping kind of shift um, all contractors to be remote as well. So, uh, so a lot of interesting stuff and worked a lot around kind of HR policies and, and things um, that supported that. Uh, and then prior to that, I'm originally from Wellington um, and I worked for a number of recruiting firms there uh, and also at NZX. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. No, that's awesome to hear. Um, and I guess kicking things off, um, first conversationalist item is around the move, you know, at the, at the current situation. Um, I'd be curious from your side what you're seeing in terms of um, the startups, startups and companies in general, just moving back to remote work, is that something you've seen quite significantly? And be curious how that looks over um, where you are in the States as well. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. Uh, it was, you know, we're February of 2022 now. It's been two years uh, since it's really all happened for us here in the US. And I can remember it quite clearly being a, a pretty big, uh, kind of panic and it's very stressful of just figuring out what we're going to do and um, a lot of the big companies were and a lot of companies in general were pushing out you know three months ahead oh we'll probably be back in the office and you know in three months oh it's going to be six months and we kept getting these dates and kept getting pushed out and the latest communications we're getting from companies is you know we may or may not come back into the office uh, and it's more around actually setting up a strategy to be hybrid permanently. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really become a, a pretty uh, critical part of, of any sort of workforce planning is, is um, accommodating for a hybrid workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's interesting is now, you know, a lot of the talent in the market is expecting it. Um, you know, opportunities that you know, we're having people straight up decline opportunities if they're not remote or have some sort of hybrid option as well. Um, so the shift to go remote and be hybrid is, is very much uh, in demand. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy that this, uh, this has um, evolved so much. And I think, um, you know, I know in New Zealand, it's kind of, kind of flip-flopping at the moment and those feelings of like, okay, what is our permanent situation going to look like? 
Um, but ultimately, you know, there's, there's in the last couple of years been a number of really good tools that have been developed and features and things to actually help us work more remotely, which I'm you know, excited to talk more about as well. Awesome. Yeah, that would definitely be great to expose to soon. Um, just a thought, if, um, if you're an attendee, if you could chuck in the, the chat there, um, like has your office gone back to remote working? Um, have you been in remote working for the past two years or kind of curious yeah, what, what your personal um, situation is with that so we can kind of get an idea of what's, what's happening around the room um, with, with you guys? Um, but yeah, definitely that's what I've been seeing as well. Um, since uh, Omicron came in, um, a lot of offices um, have shut down in the past two weeks. Um, a couple, you know, as soon as you've got one close contact in there, the whole the whole place has to go back to remote working, um, and that really does, you know, it's like it's quite a, a big thing for people that are super stressed out and. You know, we, we just had a really great summer and we're kind of just going back into the deep end of it. Um, I feel like as New Zealanders, we, we try to stay quite optimistic and think, you know, you know, like we'll be back in the office and, and everything will be great. Um, COVID will be gone. But it does, yeah, it, it's quite like it, you know, it keeps hitting you kind of thing here in New Zealand for the past two years. Um, but I think maybe this time things are a little different because we, we're realising the reality of it. So. A lot of these practices might come and you know more common play remote working um integrated into um strategies in the office and okay i've just got some comments and at the moment um office is hybrid managers have become more flexible um with that that's great to hear another hybrid model okay yeah so it looks like there's quite a few um hybrid models going around at the moment. Oh yeah, a couple of people working remotely at the moment. Oh. Oh. Cool. Yeah, I think I think you're right, Lilia. It's um, you know, I, the adjustment I think initially was probably, you know, the hardest um, is trying to figure out your new life. And, you know, even even just working, you know, with with my husband, it was, you know, strange being in, in an office with him and and you know, now he's my coworker. Um, so just kind of making some of those adjustments. Um, yes, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe that's a good topic to jump on is, is how to manage that, that balance of when you have to be at home um, and you're home all the time and, you know, you might have family, you might have kids, um, partner. Um, we'd love to hear any tips from your side on how people can, yeah, kind of find that balance and make it work. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think there's kind of what you can do personally, and then there's also what, you know, you can do you know, for your teams as well. Um, you know, I think employers have seen that are prioritising well-being and uh, the health of their employees are benefiting from retention and, you know, having um, attracting talent, right, as we sort of said before. Um, and I think, the challenges for everybody moving remote are quite different. So, you know, some people it's juggling kids and school and, um, you know, um, parenting. And, you know, for some people it's, you know, the social element, you know, not being able to connect with people and have that, you know, human connection in person. Um, for others, it's just managing maybe what's happening at home. You know, some people, um, you know, it might be in situations where it's actually easier to be at work as well. Um, and then there's things like Zoom fatigue and um, sometimes the anxiety of getting COVID if you are going into the office. So there's a lot of different, I think, types of, um, you know, ways and sort of um, challenges that manifest. But um, I think for, for leaders, I think having a lot of empathy and understanding and compassion around, you know, everyone's individual situation. Um, I think personally, there's some sort of things that I've I've thought about, you know, to overcome things like Zoom fatigue, for example. Like we hear that a lot, uh, and I think there's a lot of different strategies. You know, some of the things is um, looking at yourself all day, every day, and meetings can be a bit weird, uh, and it can it's not normal, and and sometimes you're really close and. Um, so I think just kind of getting some best practices around that. Um, one of the things that I suggest is actually just turning off your own tile. So you're not actually looking at yourself all day. And sometimes it can be distracting too. So just kind of removing that tile completely. Um, 
Other strategies for kind of meetings, right? Because you're remote, you actually need more meetings and you need more time online. Mm -hmm. But actually playing around with, you know, what's actually required to be on Zoom and what's not. Uh, so we kind of introduced things like uh, video optional meetings. You know, if, you, if you've got someone presenting or three or four people talking and the rest are just listening, do you need everybody on video? Um, or is it a, a video optional type meeting? Um, I'm sure your one-on-ones are likely to be video required. Um, and then even having days where you have no video meetings at all. Um, we call it meatless Fridays. Uh, you know, even if you're not vegetarian, uh, you know, having no meetings on a Friday. Um, so uh, just, you know, things to allow more focus time and then less time kind of on the screen um, can also help with things like that as well. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a really great idea. You're having some times where you don't necessarily have to have the video um, going on there. Um, and I swear I read something a couple of days ago. I, I can't remember where it was. They were saying people remote working can end up working more and, you know, spending more time technically working than versus, um, you know, going to the office and then and then going home. Have you seen anything around that? Is, is that something um, you think might be the case? Yeah, I, yeah, I personally deal with this. I, uh, yeah, I spent, I was spending an hour and a half, actually probably closer to two hours commuting every day. Mm. Um, and now I probably spend that extra two hours working. Um, mm. So I think, I think part of it is that remote working, uh, the rules are different, right? And I think the idea of having this nine to five when you're at home is just mm. a lot harder. You know, I, you can, um, you know, having flexibility is, is a really great um, part of remote working, um, but ultimately you end up working at slightly different times. So it can create a little bit of a gray area around schedule. Uh, I actually often heard that people felt a lot of pressure to be online and constantly be seen and, you know, always kind of plugged in because, you know, they weren't able to be physically seen. And so I think there's one that kind of pressure to always be online yeah. and uh, and doing that um but also you know finding those boundaries for yourself you know it's just easy to sit there in front of your computer and and um you know you don't actually have to get up and go home so yeah. you know trying to sort of create some boundaries around that mm -hmm. um some of the uh strategies I guess that I, I kind of use and, I, and more than anything I think having an open dialogue with your with your team and with your manager around your hours and preferences uh, if you you know prefer to work from you know seven till two and then get back on from six to eight um, great you know working remotely might offer you some of that flexibility um, but you know knowing when you know and for your manager to be aware, like, hey, you're going to be out of these, you know, out of these times. Yeah. yeah um, also, there's actually a lot of really good tools that can help with this. You know, Slack, for example, like is a really popular tool and kind of managing a lot of remote work. And you can set your time to be away and, you know, help just, you know, not get notifications during that time, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think... Actually, something I, I, I realized I, I, did, I was guilty of this um, and, you know, I like to work late. And so sending emails, um, you know, at night and, you know, it can have a, uh, a negative impact on your team, kind of adding to some of that stress of like, oh, okay, I'm getting emailed and I, I need to respond to her because she's emailing me and now I'm thinking about it all night and I'm up. It can just create some sort of manifest stress. Um, so something I actually started doing was, delaying my emails to send the next morning. So even I'm working at night, I just delay them all to send when I know when people are going to be up in the morning and, and looking at it. Um, Cause there's really nothing that they could do at 11 o'clock at night. So, um, you know, Good. even though that's my preference, I don't want to put that kind of stress on other people as well. So that's sort of the boundary setting. And, and I think setting your own boundaries of what time am I working? Yeah. But then also respecting other people's boundaries around it as well. <laughs> That's a good point. How great would it be if, um, you know, if Gmail had a little 
you know, automatic don't, don't send until 8 a.m. the next day. Because it's so awkward when, you, when you're, you know, you're doing your emails nearly at midnight and, you, you know, you're doing it, so you want to send it. But, you know, it's, it's probably going to come across a bit weird. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, Gmail does on, uh, on the phone. So. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, person um, myself. Um, awesome. Yeah, I just, and I think actually something, something else, um, hmm. just actually taking time to unplug because, yeah. you know, when you can't, I don't know if you're like me, but I, you know, my time off, I was always traveling. I was always going somewhere and doing something. And then when I couldn't do that, it was, I just... Uh, yeah, I work so I wouldn't take time off and so I wouldn't mm. unplug and it would just be this constant and so I think um, as a leader you know also you know trying to lead by example and actually taking some time off to unplug yeah. um, but something I've seen done really well which I think is really well received is having things like mental health days or wellness days where everybody takes the time you know takes time off and everybody unplugs and it can also be a kind of a fun way to just share what you did on that day and sort of build some camaraderie and um, you know, share photos and that sort of thing too. Cool, awesome. Um, that kind of ties in um, with what I'm thinking of chatting on next is how do you keep up that kind of energy when you're not in the office and you're not around people? And because, you know, when you're in person, you, you feel that buzz um, and versus being sitting on your own at home, um, it's, it's not quite the same. So I'd be curious if you've seen ways to, you know, kind of keep, keep that energy going. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I think there's sort of you know, a couple of things of that. I think, um, you know, part of it is communication. Right. And then part of it is, you know, how do you sort of move from what is, historically this synchronous real-time in-person communication to moving to the more of this asynchronous right on different schedules and different people and so sometimes it can feel a little fragmented I think in terms of communication with the team and um you know some people are on video some people are in office and you know sometimes it can feel a little bit awkward so I think um Again, like identifying tools that help you manage some of those tasks and um, work collaboratively as well. Um, so there's, you know, things like you've got Trello and Monday and, and kind of tools that help kind of manage tasks so people can kind of work into it. Um, but then also setting up your meetings a little bit differently um, to have a little bit more, uh, sort of interactiveness or different types of checkpoints. So your, your kind of timing and your frequency of meetings is probably going to change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we set up a, like a daily, you know, a daily sync, which, um, you know, in the office, we probably wouldn't really need um, as, as much. And it, it ran a little bit differently, but then on, on a video, you know, we would, everyone would just sort of um, say what they were doing and people would, wouldn't get off mute and it just became a little bit disjointed, but we turned it into a bit of a game. So it was like, you know, you sort of popcorn to the next person or, you know, you'd add in sort of something fun to your daily meetings. Yeah. Um, so just trying to sort of inject a little bit of energy and, and figuring out your flow of, of communication and, and your cadence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think, the other part of that is how do you how do you maintain culture and how do you uh, yeah exactly have that fun and I think there's a question here of kind of that kind of vibe and you know energy um, so you know because it's not happening organically at the water cooler or the coffee machine um, you really need to create sort of intentional space around um, social interactions so. You know, part of that is actually having intentional time that isn't related to, to work. Um, I think actually um, there's um, some quite cool tools coming out now at the moment where you can actually just have like, like hubs of conversations going on and people can just hop in. Maybe you're talking about, you know, cats or maybe you're talking about cooking or motorcycles or whatever it is, and you can just hop into those conversations. Um, you know, even hosting hosting events, you know, there is a whole lot around hosting remote um, social events for, um, 
you know, online painting and cooking and, um, you know, we actually had a really fun um, uh, talent show uh, once, um, which was awesome um, and, you know, kind of gave us a little <laughs> insight into a few people's lives and into their homes and what they're doing and, um, you know, that can just be a fun, intentional way to sort of build, continue to build those connections and establish trust, which isn't just focused on work. Mm -hmm. um, I love that idea of like a talent night and pain nights and, and different things like that. That's really yeah, cool. Definitely. Um, question um, comes from, in terms of the tools. Um, yeah, perhaps if you can kind of run through all the, dif the different tools that you've come across and um, what ones you'd recommend the most. Um, for people jumping into the whole remote workspace at the moment? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Slack uh, is certainly, I think, you know, by far one of the most widely used. Um, they have a lot of functionality around channels, immediate chat, you can have team huddles on it, you can do screen sharing. Um, you know, that is by far, I think, probably one of the, the most common ones used. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Zoom, obviously a great tool. They've created a lot of really good features, uh, like breakout rooms is, you know, one of my, one of my favorites. Um, actually, sort of an idea on that is uh, at the end of some of our team meetings, if it's just been leadership talking, at the end, we go out into breakout rooms and just randomly put people in different teams just to chat about themselves or intro or, you know, have a quick sort of networking session. Yeah. Um, so utilizing things like that also really good for training too, having those breakout rooms. Uh, you've got Google Meet. Again, they've kind of brought out some new features with like companion mode uh, to help with like sharing and, and uh, screen sharing. Uh, MS Teams have their own functionality as well. Um, so those are kind of uh, probably the more common ones. Some of the, the project management or task management tools that I quite like um, we're using is Trello. Um, so Trello boards are kind of a collaborative space. You can, um, you know, go through on, um, move kind of tasks through different stages and people can kind of see where you're at with it. So that's a nice way to collaborate. You've got Monday, which is a sort of project management, task management tool as well. Um, also the one I mentioned actually about the, the social interaction, it's mm -hmm. called Tukan events. And, um, you know, that you can sort of set up, yeah, different rooms and groups for, for people to go into. And, and we could probably send some of these out too. Yeah. Um, um, do you spell that? T-O-U-C-A-N T -O -U -C -A -N events. T-O-U-C-A-N. Cool. Awesome. I hadn't heard of that one before. That'd be great. We should check that out. I'm just making a little list in our chat here um, for people to follow up on. Awesome. Um, You've got also uh, something something quite cool that is it kind of helps again with kind of creating that energy and that buzz and and something that I think is a bit of a challenge also managing remotely is um, performance management and rewards and recognition yeah. can be a really challenging area um, and so you know part of it is that you so used to be used to being seen right you're so just being like, oh, noticing someone helping someone else, or you know, you can kind of see how they're interacting and see how they show up. But as a manager, you like really can't you know, see that. And so, um, you know, part of it is I, I think having things like peer, well, having having regular meetings with your with your employees. You know, not just waiting for a quarterly or an annual feedback session to review what happened, but doing it much more frequently and like tracking all of the achievements either having a shared running list or, you know, specific dedicated time to talk about goals. Um, but also there's a really interesting tool that I've seen as well as Bonusly. Um, and there's other ones like it too, but essentially the idea is that uh, you are recognizing your peers on a constant basis. So you have, you know, a certain amount of, of points you can tip your colleagues with and, um, for something that they've done for you or to recognize them or reward them. So it's in the moment time that you can, um, uh, you know, actually, you know, help boost morale and, you know, support each other. And then as a manager, they can say like, hey, I mean, you know, Lily is getting tipped like wild over here. What are you doing? What are all these things? Um, so it's a good way to just recognize that as well. 
Oh, that's that's really cool. I have to check that one out as well. I'll just chuck that in the chat as well. If anyone was um was that bonus.ly um appears to be the website there. Um just got a couple of questions coming up now. Okay, um, a question from Robert Owen. Um, you mentioned trust. When hiring remote workers, potentially overseas contractors, how do you help build a trusted relationship? And have you seen a change in work similar to measurable micro projects? Um, so first one is around sort of building building trust yeah. and then um, measuring projects. Is that right? Um, change in work oh like a change in so it's you um people manage projects as smaller projects versus larger projects i think is what he's saying um and so a change in the way you measure um people's work perhaps yeah i think um yeah i, I think uh in terms of um i'll kind of start with like the trust piece of how do you actually how do you establish that um and um, then so we, were gonna, um, we were going to chat a bit on the whole process of hiring remotely as well. Perhaps would you be keen to give us a rundown um, on what you're seeing around that and any advice around that? And then that can kind of tie into this question about building trust. Um, so yeah, in yes, yeah, so in terms of yeah, hiring remotely, um, you, you have quite a bit of experience with that since that's what your, um, your company helps out with. Um, be keen to hear, hear your thoughts around how that goes um, and, you know, any challenges that you come across and, and ways you manage to do that effectively. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think uh, there's um, a big shift in kind of what you need to hire for when you're hiring remotely. You know, your criteria for um, candidates is different, um, you know, you need to kind of look at, well, how is someone going to be successful in a remote environment and what, what skills do they need? So, you know, looking and adjusting your skill set, you know, you're looking for people who are going to be accountable, who have good communication, who are, you know, self-motivated, they take ownership of what they do. So assessing these things is going to be quite important. And, um, you know, for a leadership style, I, I think this is really important because, you know, being kind of a, a micromanager in a remote environment is very, very challenging, right? Because you have this sort of want to, you know, control what's happening, see what's happening at all times. And I think, you know, you, you probably want to kind of shift and even equip your managers to be able to, you know, have trust, um, but also be very clear about tasks and, and deadlines and having, you know, systems and ways to track that. Um, and that's, you know, a, a skill set within itself. You know, how do you get someone who's able to build trust remotely with employees? Um, so, you know, I think that can be, um, you know, a bit of a shift in mostly your candidate criteria. So that will change. And then, you know, I, I always think this is really, really important, but when it comes to interviewing and actually assessing candidates, um, you have, you know, in, on remote uh, interviews, you're picking up less signals about how someone interacts, you know, with, um, with the reception desk or as they're coming in or what they're doing. So some of those things are lost. So it emphasizes the importance of having a very clear interview structure. And not only does it help remove bias in general, but it is twice as effective at, at, at assessing someone's effectiveness in the role. And so by having a really clear criteria and clear assessment criteria, it actually just helps you pick up the signals of whether they're going to be good as a remote manager or as a remote or hybrid employee. And so um, I think just, you know, really defining that I think is, is going to help you be more successful in hiring remotely. Mm -hmm. And then Fortunately, you know, we've made a lot of progress on you know, different tools and things you can use. You know, hiring engineers has certainly, um, you know, become you know, a, a lot easier remotely with the likes of like a hacker rank or Codility. Um, they have online whiteboarding sessions and um, take home coding exercises. You've got live coding exercises, all of it. And so I think, you know, with the introduction of some of those tools, it makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um also it can be quite good for you know people in like um 
engineering roles and software roles uh, to be at their own setup doing some of those things too. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I think you know that has certainly had a really positive impact. Um, something else I've noticed is uh, the timing to schedule interviews has actually been a lot easier because um, people are at home. And so, um, you know, for some, for some managers, it's probably like, oh, are people interviewing at home and what are they doing? But on the flip side of your recruiting, it also is quite helpful to have that sort of flexibility and scheduling um, to set things up and, and move that process along a bit quicker. Um, but I would say probably one of the, the biggest downfalls and um, the thing you really need to get right is onboarding. And most companies and most people will report that, you know, that onboarding is, is you know, usually subpar. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of dynamics that change in onboarding a new hire. And, you know, ultimately... Um, you know, you really need to think about how are you going to integrate this person into your company and what do they need to know um, to be successful? And, and this is really going to impact their ramp time, you know, their retention, their future performance. So, you know, with onboarding, um, you know, I, I think historically you can just sit them next to somebody and, and they can pick up by osmosis of what's going on and the culture and how people are talking. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it's as simple as like having a checklist, right, for your hiring managers and your onboarding team, mm -hmm. making sure your managers are setting up people to talk with on the first day, just to build friends and connections and do they have work and um, are you setting time aside to actually spend with them? Mm -hmm. um, something actually we... Um, I do with my new hires is I just have like co-working time. So, you know, just sit and have a, a video open or not even on video, just, you know, available to chat and you're working for an hour. And then if things come up, you're just there and available for questions. Um, but then also having some kind of formal training and stuff in place. Um, mm -hmm. And then for employees, um, not having a checklist for them that they can both work through on their own, but then also have things they can follow up and do. You know, there's nothing worse than starting a new job and you're just sitting at your desk kind of wondering what you're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. It can feel like um, you're not adding value or you're not contributing. So, you know, I think it's just important for, for people to kind of have an, their own plan that they can follow, but then also, um, you know, be involved in some more kind of formal trainings and things as well. Mm, awesome. Yeah, no, there's some really cool things. Definitely do love that. Yeah, virtual co-working. Um, it's always a whole new concept in itself. Um, awesome, let me just check if there's any other questions that have come through. Um, um, if you look at your current recruitment pipeline from sourcing to interviewing to onboarding, what is the most challenging part? What's the most challenging part of the pipeline, sourcing, interviewing? Um, you know, I would probably say that um, you know sourcing is definitely uh, you know, finding finding good people uh, mm. and also uh, yeah it's probably one of the biggest challenges um, so I think you know there's a lot of competition right now and mm. you know having um, uh, a really kind of robust story to, to tell, um, which I think includes, you know, how you offer flexibility and what does hybrid work look like and do you have a remote first culture um, really actually helps you to even attract those candidates, you know, by being able to talk about that during during sourcing. Uh, so I think I think that's probably one of the more the more challenging parts um, is actually, you know, identifying really good talent um, and getting really good people into the pipeline. Um, yeah, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest areas. <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, this is more of a, more of a uh, comment from earlier around um, here in New Zealand, um, looking at ways to open up bubbles in offices. So you're familiar with that, right? Like, so like you have like just a small amount of people here and a small amount of people here. Have you seen that happen in the States or is, because I know it's quite different, like over there you've got, you've got all the rapid antigen tests and things, right? So where we're quite behind on that. Um, I don't know when that's 
that's going to come in exactly. Um, there's been a lot of drama around it. Um, but yeah, what have you seen in terms of office spaces over in the States for you? Um, do people go to work and they grab a test before they get in the office or how, did, how does that look? Yeah, so this is really interesting and actually it's it's constantly evolving as the, the rules and regulations are evolving. It's also state by state. So what we say here in California could be different to New York, to Texas, to, to wherever. And so um, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I've tried to do with, with some of my clients and also I've seen work really well is, is just kind of establish some guidelines and, um, you know, make it, I think there's a lot of uncertainty around it. And so sort of people can get like nervous about, well, you know, what were they doing on the weekend and, you know, how, you know, you know, basically it's kind of this trust thing, right. Of like, you don't know what other people are doing or if they've been exposed. So, um, you know, I think we've kind of had, I've seen sort of a staggered approach. So, you know, just kind of core people that need to be in the office mm -hmm. coming in, um, but then having, you know, distancing masks, um, you know, just being kind of respectful of, of you know, each other and, and that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. um, also seeing uh, sort of one-off gatherings. So versus, uh, you know, different people showing up in the office mm -hmm. um, on different days, which, you know, we've seen as well. Um, having like, okay, cool, we're just going to do like a monthly, you know, everyone's going to be in the office on this day or we're going to do an event that, you know, we have enough space and it's COVID friendly. Um, so trying to, you know, use that time to be, um, get everybody in the same place at the same time, um, mm -hmm. but, in, you know, in a safe way, of obviously, if people are comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but, we, you know, for people who, especially in the height of it, um, you know, we did just have essential people going in. You know, is it, are you required to do your role uh, in the office and, you um, you know, putting some parameters around that and guidelines, like everybody, you know, everybody tests and, you know, everybody, you know, wears a mask. Um, you know, if you think you've been exposed, stay at home, uh, yeah. you know, putting timelines around that as well. Um, so obviously it's different with different testing available. Um, yeah. But I think just, you know, having a, having a policy in place, you know, you think you've been exposed, you know, don't come in. Um, now most, you know, I think most people are kind of, um, you know, back, you know, have some sort of hybrid, you know, so some people are going in and just prefer that. Um, so I think it really varies kind of depending on, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what industry you're in, what, what product or service you're delivering. Um, but I, I have seen some people trying to integrate some sort of um, hybrid or um, you know, certain days that people are coming in together for the sake of actually having that social interaction. Yeah, cool. That's quite interesting because I guess what the situation here is, yeah, like people, um, offices, you know, they're, they're shutting down so people are going back to remote working, but you, you can still like go out to, to restaurants, to cafes, to bars. Um, and so it's like you could, you could still catch up to people in a, in a close proximity um, in other settings. So it's, it's, it's quite odd, yeah. Um, but I like the idea of, yeah, maybe the workplace organizers, something like that every, every you know, once a month or so, and just make sure that everyone's respectful of whether or not they think they might have COVID or not. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's quite strange at the moment how you can still socialize like normal um, here in New Zealand. But um, just uh, keen to open up the Q&A now. So anyone watching, if you have any questions, feel free to chuck them in the Q&A um, Ashin or the chat over there, I'll keep an eye on both. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left. So um, yeah, any questions, any thoughts, um, any comments on what your workplace is doing at the moment? Definitely keen to learn like, yeah, what's actually happening out there at the moment. Like is, is your workplace organizing um, social catch-ups or is it complete just stay at home kind of kind of thing um, happening at the moment? Um, because yeah, it's, it's constantly changing yeah, just these past two weeks. Um, and it's it's really hard to know, yeah, what's gonna happen over the next um, couple of months um, with the whole COVID situation. Um, so yeah, feel free to chuck any questions up there. Um, oh, I just, I think coming back to this question, Lilia, um, about trust. So when, um, when hiring remote workers, potentially overseas contractors, how do you help build a trusted relationship? 
Mm. Uh, so this is a really interesting topic. And I think, um, you know, when you talk about having sort of a remote friendly or remote first culture, um, it actually opens up a more, more opportunities to be able to do this, right? If, if you can really get it right in terms of building a culture that is inclusive and, and helps, um, you know, of, of remote people, then this actually becomes a lot easier. Um, you know, we were working, um, you know, I had probably about 30% of my team in India and, um, you know, we had regular uh, video meetings and, you know, it was, um, you know, even actually part of the talent show and, you know, things we were doing and it actually kind of gave us these, uh, you know, because we were more on video and in each other's homes, it like really actually was kind of vulnerable for a lot of people and, and a lot of us. And I think sometimes showing that vulnerability and that little peek into people's lives or their, you know, their cat coming across their screen or some art that they did in, in the background can actually really spark some like conversations that you just may have never had before and, and actually strengthen some of those relationships and trust. Um, and so I think, um, you know, being kind of really open to that is, um, you know, actually a way to, to foster that. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, working in sort of smaller measurable um, micro projects. And I would say I haven't sort of seen this specifically, but I, I think um, knowing that it's, you know, harder to sort of coordinate bigger groups and kind of having smaller teams and kind of, um, you know, having uh, work within that, you know, certainly I think will will help kind of build trust with, within those groups. Um, you know, it's a lot harder to have 20 people on a Zoom call versus, you know, eight to eight to 10. So um, yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting um, way, but I, I also think using, you know, some of the, the tools like Monday and Trello will, will also help with that. Yeah, awesome. Um, question in the chat here around um, Andrew says he's currently hiring offshore engineers um, and loves the idea of using tools to validate quality. Um, can you list any tools that you use for recruitment? Yes. Uh, so there's some, so Codility and HackerRank um, are some of the ones that um, you can use for uh, like screening, like for coding tests and, and exercises. Um, there's also some other interesting tools that I've sort of been exploring um, in the market. So there's actually one called Searchlight, uh, and that's a really interesting platform, which can, it, it kind of helps you with three areas. So you've got your building your, what you're looking for, your criteria, and, um, you know, if you're looking for remote people and you're looking for communication and, you know, leadership and you know various things. It helps you develop that comp those competencies. Um, then it actually does like reference checking, but then it actually has uh, a kind of performance measurement based on the the things you said you needed and the things you recruited for. So it has this kind of quality measurement as well, and I think it's a really kind of interesting tool um, that we're actually looking at at the moment too. So um, yeah, I quite like that one. Um, oh, cool, and yeah. Put those in the chat there. Um, a question here from Max. Um, how do you structure a job ad for um, remote engineering role? What should or shouldn't be in it and in what order? Now that one might be a bit a bit um, in depth. Um, do you want to touch lightly on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so structuring a, a job ad for remote uh, software engineering role and what should and should not be included in what order. Um, I, I think really that the key here is, you know, what a what a software engineer is interested in um, and what's going to be, you know, what what's important. And I think, you know, we see a lot of um, a lot of the technologies you're using are quite interesting to engineers. So including that. Um, you know, having, you know, what, what your policy is around remote working, um, that's sometimes a hard no if you don't have a remote policy. Um, so talking about that, your schedule, um, you know, talking about what you offer as an employee, you know, what are your other benefits, your perks, um, 
the opportunity of why, like why work for your company and what's going to be interesting. Is it the build of your product? Is it that it's brand new? Is it the impact it's going to have on your customers or the world? You know, what's the mission? So kind of all of those things I think are really what are going to attract someone to potentially leave. Um, and at the moment, there's a really big discussion around uh, pay transparency and whether, um, you know, we, in some states, uh, it's a requirement that pay is included on, on job descriptions. Um, so straight up out of the gate, you know, you know, where you stand, which is causing people to really, you know, look at you know, how they level um, their talent within their organization and how do you fit in with a certain banding. Um, but I, you know, I would say those are some of the most important things for engineers. Um, you know, order, I think is, is um, you know, probably your why and your company and your mission, and then kind of talking about your responsibilities later down. Yeah, love it. That's really cool overview of what to, um, to include in there. And um, good point and trying to keep front of mind, like what does this particular person value most um, and making sure to include that in there. Um, let's, let's say um, for, for say Kiwi founders here in New Zealand um, and you know, they've just been told everyone needs to work at home and now they're looking at setting up um, a hybrid model. Um, what would you recommend as a way to approach that? Is there, you know, somewhere online they might go to figure out what, you know, how do you actually design that, that hybrid model or would they have someone else do that for them? Um, yeah, just curious from, from that perspective for people who might be in their boat at this, at this moment, um, what, you know, how to approach that. Yeah, so I mean, there, there is a fair amount of resources online of, of kind of looking at how, how you set that up. Um, yeah. There are, you know, people who can specifically come in and, and help you set that up. I, I help a lot of my clients to do that and, and kind of set up for a remote, more remote environment. Um, so, you know, I think there are a lot of different tools. I think first off is probably like reviewing, you know, you know, how do you, how do you want to approach it? You know, what's your, um, you know, what's your philosophy around it and sort of deciding what you want to do and, and looking and reviewing your benefits and wellness policy. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, historically you may have been spending on happy hours and lunches and kind of social events or things in the office, um, how can you shift some of those resources to actually help employees be, be remote? Um, so thinking about, you know, shifting, uh, actually um, some companies provide like a stipend when you first start or, you know, even for existing employees to help them set up with a remote office. Um, you know, a lot of people don't have a proper setup or lighting or chair or desk and all these things can give you physical, um, you know, you know, can impact you physically. And so, uh, you know, that could be a great way to say, hey, okay, make sure you have a proper setup and, you know, you can expense these things. Um, thinking about how you might shift to some sort of, um, you know, wellness day, like having wellness days or having fitness programs or spending. So how can you sort of shift? And I'm not saying kind of add a bunch of, you know, spend more money and add more money, but how do you kind of shift that to be a little bit more around that kind of well-being and, and remote setup? Yeah. Um, and then also having a plan for, you know, COVID as well. You know, what, what happens if it actually, you know, someone gets COVID, what do you do? You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, thinking a lot about your communication and your culture and your onboarding. So th those are probably like four big areas um, mm -hmm. to kind of consider and um, kind of look at everything you do, you know, every meeting you have, all the policies you set up, you know, how, how you interact and, and does it foster a good remote um, or hybrid culture? Mm -hmm. Cool, awesome. Yeah, some really great um, insights there for those looking to sort of set up that remote working model. Um, question here from Erica. Um, recruiting in today's candidate market is so different to what it used to be. Um, what are some new trends that you're seeing and what techniques are you using to be successful? Yeah, so uh, it is a very, very different market at the moment. Um, you know, we talk about the, the great resignation and um, I like to call it the big shuffle, right? Everyone's just moving around and going to different places. So um, 
I think some of the trends that I'm seeing are, um, again, what people are looking for and uh, uh, different motivators than you know, before. People are wanting to join companies that are mission driven or you know, have a purpose or people want to kind of know that they're contributing or you know, you know, feel rewarded. Um, so I think that, um, you know, using um, and thinking a lot about your employer brand um, is a really big um, uh, sort of trend is just like, instead of just this being a recruiting job to talk about it, actually having this as part of your marketing strategy and thinking about how do we talk about our company? Why do people want to work here? You know, how do we communicate that and then really talking about it? Um, so I think employer branding, yeah. um, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion is, is a huge um, you know, topic right now, and and people are really working to uh, relook at their job descriptions. You know, how how are they inclusive? You know, how are we? How do we have a really fair process by having interview structures? You know, how do we um, make fair assessments around pay, around offers? Uh, it um, should really be in everything that we do. How do we have more diversity within our top of funnel and candidate pipeline as well? So I think. Um, you know, a lot of kind of structure, things about removing bias within the process. Uh, and then also, you know, automation has kind of become a, a, a bit of a theme within recruiting. Um, so, you know, tools that help you automate, you know, some of your communication or surveys and those types of things to really improve your process. Um, you know, some of the tools, I mean, I, I use like a lever, a greenhouse um, from like ATS, but um, things like GEM, I think are really interesting recruiting tools um, that have been quite helpful recently too. <laughs> cool, awesome. Um, so we've got 10 minutes um, left if anyone has anything else um, they'd love to ask Colette about while we've got her here. Um, otherwise, you, you mentioned, Colette, you, you'd be happy to, to follow up if anyone wanted to have a chat with you afterwards as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, certainly happy to, to provide any more detail or chat about your own situation or whatever the case is. I'm always happy and, and open for a chat. So, um, yeah, by all means, yeah, feel free to reach out. Awesome. That, no, I really, really, really appreciate um, you being keen to help out the community with that. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a changing world, um, you know, and I, I, the shift to remote, I think, has just been a bit of a game changer for the whole, you know, for the whole world, really. Um, but, you know, for, for us, it's been, um, you know, personally, I actually got COVID over the holidays and like many people, you know, have here and, and um, you know, I was so thankful for our working arrangement and, mm -hmm. You know, yes, we took a few days off, but there was almost a three week period where we had to quarantine, you know, between my husband and I, you know, having it at different times. And, you know, that could have been three weeks of productivity lost, um, but we were both thankfully in environments that were really remote friendly and we didn't really miss a beat in terms of picking up again and, and doing it. So, um, you know, I think having a, having a remote and hybrid strategy and being really intentional about it and creating a culture and, you know, being kind of inclusive, using really good tools, having good onboarding can really be in a competitive advantage. And I think ultimately it will open up a lot of um, opportunities to hire people in different places. You know, you open up your talent pools, you kind of have a chance to to really kind of diversify the people that you have coming into your business just by sheer way of where they're sitting. Um, so I think, you know, it can be a, a really, uh, yeah, a really kind of positive shift um, to kind of open up some of these things. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, a question from Robert um, about contractors in India. He's just curious how you found those contractors. Like, was it through freelance um, platforms or...? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we were actually hiring full-time and full-time in India, but also contractors. Um, I think, you know, there are various companies who, um, mm. you know, we've partnered with as well who, uh, yeah, contracting um, companies um, through platforms, through, um, oh, gosh, uh, that's me right now, but there, there is another platform um, 
when you can upwork, you know, things like that, where it's, uh, um, you know, easy to get contractors that way too. So, yeah, and um, lots and, of people reaching out. Um, and how should people best reach out to if they came? Email or LinkedIn or? Yeah, email or LinkedIn. I'm happy to pop my email in there if anyone wants to connect. Um, and then also, um, yeah, feel free to connect on LinkedIn and, and follow up that way as well. Cool. Awesome. And then some final words of wisdom. Um, so what are some key highlights you want people to leave um, after this webinar? Uh, think about how you can be inclusive of both uh, you know, people working remotely and, you know, people in office. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's often forgotten that when you're sitting in an office on a Zoom meeting, you've got other people there. Uh, mm -hmm. It just doesn't land and it's not as engaging. So think about all your meetings. Think about how that impacts people remotely. Um, you know, would you have a good experience if you were sitting on the other end of that phone? Um, and then also, yeah, onboard people, um, have a plan, be prepared, make sure someone sends them a laptop, yeah. um, you know, be organized around it. Yeah. Um, but I think more than anything, like, you know, embrace it. Um, the change, I think, could be really, really positive for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, if we, you know, can really, if you can really make it work, it really will help kind of change the culture and, um, you know, create a lot more kind of diversity and equity um, across the board. So, um yeah embrace it let's be remote let's be hybrid <laughs> and I, I loved as we showed this highlight um having sort of like at home events like yeah like the talent show paint nights or um different things you might not have thought of um to just bring people together and have fun even though they're still stuck at home um I think it's such a cool idea and I reckon you, we almost need some more work in that space um for companies to provide things like that perhaps um so it kind of sparked some ideas there. Um, but, and I love to use the word, um, the big shuffle. I, I'm not sure if I've come across that before. Is that, did you, did you come up with that? <laughs> I think someone might have said it to me and I was like, that is genius. So I was like, that's definitely how I'm seeing things right now. <laughs> is the other one, it just sounds so depressing. Um, but the big shuffle, that's nice. It's like, honestly, the not my LinkedIn feed is full of those LinkedIn changes, so you get this little animation whenever someone starts a new role, and I'm, it's just full of these little pictures. <laughs> um, and I'm like, wow, um, everyone's starting something new right now. Um, but yeah, a lot, lot of change going on at the moment. Um, but it's a good time to, um, you know, to work on things in your own companies and and yeah, put together these kind of hybrid um, working models. And yeah, um, cool. Okay, so I've had some cool comments come through from everyone. Um, Oh, cluedup.co.nz. Okay, I'll have a I'll have a look at that. That's a good one. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jane. There's actually also um, Airbnb shifted some of their services to do uh, experiences versus you know just doing their normal right. vacation, vacation rentals. So um, that's actually been quite interesting to look at as well. So um, I think because I, I know like we've we've got Airbnb experiences, but. I don't know if many people actually use it over here. Um, yeah, I have never used it myself personally. They're always quite expensive. Um, but cool concept. I, I mean, I love the concept for sure. sure um, I'm yeah. sure there's others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll have to check out this um, cleared up um, event there. Cool. Awesome. I am nearly at 11. So I think we should wrap up um, and say a big thank you to Colette for coming on um, for the past hour and having a chat to us. And um, this webinar. Um, hopefully it's been recorded if, if Zoom isn't, isn't playing up today um, and then will be posted onto our YouTube channel and LinkedIn afterwards and also I'll be uploading it as a podcast on um, Spotify. <laughs> Spotify, Shopify. Um, Spotify afterwards as well so if um, you know if you know someone that would um, gain some insights um, from this chat you can send it their way um, but otherwise, big thank you, yeah, to Colette for, for coming on and chatting to us. Thank you so much, Lilia. It's been great, uh, great chatting. And, and certainly if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Cool. Well, catch you around um, on the next time. Oh, yeah, I just need your email come through there. I know the chat disappears. Um, so if, if anyone misses that email there, um, LinkedIn might be the next best um, way to reach out. 
Awesome. Okay, cool. Catch you guys later. Yeah.